Spain's economy is in bad shape. In the economic press, this company typically appears not exactly for the better, with a skyrocketing unemployment rate, companies that are not growing, mediocre salaries, and a temporary employment rate that is increasing rapidly, things are not looking good. But what if I told you that's not quite true? Spain is not poor as a whole, but has two very different economies. The northern half, made up of communities such as Madrid, the Basque country, and Catalonia, is much wealthier than the southern half, where there are much less developed communities, such as Andalusia and Extremadura. Yes, in these cases, we are talking about the regions that produce half of all the olive oil in the world. However, despite this, if the Spanish economy is in such a bad way, it is largely because the south of the country is dragging it down. And let's see, obviously in all countries there is territorial inequality. There are always some regions that are richer than others. And a good example of this is Germany, where the eastern part, which was communist until the 1990s, is today much poorer than the western part. In the Spanish case, however, the reasons for poverty of the south do not seem so clear. That is, Andalusia and Extremadura were never communist, as East Germany was. Even more confusing, historically, southern Spain was in fact the richest region of all. Al-Andalus was a real bastion of wealth during the Middle Ages under Muslim rule. The city of Cordoba even became the most populated city in Europe, with nearly half a million inhabitants. And these days, you only need to walk through the streets of Granada or Almeria to get an understanding of their enormous economic power at that time. But after the Muslim domination, it was much the same story. Cadiz was one of the most important cities in Spain and the world for centuries. It was the departure point for Christopher Columbus's second expedition. It was practically the nerve center of global maritime trade. Curious fact, if Hispanic Americans these days have an accent similar to the Andalusian one, it is precisely because of the strong commercial connections between Southern Spain and the Americas. So visual economic community, knowing all this, it's clear that the pieces don't seem to fit. Why on earth did the successful south of Spain become one of the poorest regions in Europe? Was it intentional or a curse of fate? At what point did poverty hit places like Andalusia and Extremadura? In this video, we tell you all about it. Why is southern Spain the poorest part of the country? Why not the north? Why not the east? Well, the first clue can be found in a river, the Targus. The Targus River is the one that curiously separates the rich provinces from the poor ones. Somehow, it is as if this river were the boundary between wealth and poverty in Spain. But is this a coincidence? And how can a single river so drastically separate the economy of an entire country? Well, you see, the answer is not so much in the river, but in what happened behind it lines. In the Middle Ages, when the southern plateau was the scene of a bloody war between Christian kingdoms and Muslim empires, the south of the Targus River was a fearsome battlefield that was subject to insecurity, violence, and death. And let's see, while it is true that the Christian kingdoms that were in present-day Spain fought against the Muslims throughout the Iberian Peninsula, when they arrived south of the Targus, things changed. Up until that point, northern Spain had been conquered slowly. As territory was gained, the civilian population built settlements little by little. Let's say that the progressive conquest allowed the construction of a social and human network that made northern Spain very cohesive. In fact, the conquest was so progressive that it took more than 400 years from the initial frontier in Asturias to reach the Targus. However, when the conquest crossed the river, the pace shot up. And in only 100 years, the northern Christian kingdoms managed to dominate the vast majority of the southern peninsula and cornered the Muslims in the kingdom of Granada. That is, while the north of the country was conquered in 400 years, the south took only 100 years. But what does the rate of recapture have to do with the economy? Well, apparently a lot. The territories that were conquered the fastest are precisely the same ones today that are the poorest of all. But what is the mechanism behind all this? How could the rapid conquest of the South be the cause of their misery? The answer lies in nobility. 
Northern Spain was a territory close to the crown, where it had power and resources with which to advance territory. Meanwhile, to the south of the Targus, the situation was completely different. It was a very large expanse of territory, where the crown no longer had so much power. That is why, in order to expel the Muslims from the south, the kings had to ask great favors from the nobility and the military orders. In a way, they externalized and professionalized the conquest. Although, along with it, the nobles and military were grouped in regiments that advanced quickly and created few settlements, fed on livestock that they could easily move, and did not stay too long in the same place. As a consequence, even today, it can be observed that the land south of the Targus has far fewer towns and cities than any other part of Spain. What's more, in southern Spain, there are provinces such as Ciudad Real, Albacete, and Badajoz that have a lower density of settlements than the Finnish region of Lapland, basically the North Pole. And visual economic community, the lack of settlements had terrible economic consequences for the southern economy. Pay attention. The Curse of Conquest As we have said, the nobility was in charge of taking over southern Spain, but of course they did not do it for free. At the end of the conquest, the nobles who captained the Castilian armies claimed vast tracts of conquered territory for themselves, and with that, the nobles gained enormous power in the region. They became an elite that accumulated a lot of wealth at the expense of the common people. Without going any further, Andalusia and Extremadura became the regions of Spain with the highest concentration of territory in the hands of the nobility. That is to say, while in the north, almost 80% of the peasants owned the land they cultivated. In the south, the figure barely reached 30%. The vast majority of the land belonged to landowners. Even so, the problem of extreme power in the hands of a few was not only a problem of inequality, but this in turn generated other economic problems. The most notable of these is that in those places where land ownership was less well distributed, education rates were much lower. Specifically, for every 10 percentage points of landless peasants in a region, the percentage of of the population that could read and write was reduced by 5.1 percentage points. The question is, why did inequality lead to lower education? Some economists, such as Beltran Tapia, argue that given the poverty of landless peasants, they could not easily finance their children's education. What's more, the low density of settlements, which, keep in mind, originated from the reconquest, made it difficult for families living in the countryside to send their children to schools in the urban centers. The question is, why didn't the government or society create some kind of public education? In fact, in many places throughout Spain, elementary schools were financed by municipal or church contributions. Yet, local elites were able to block public funding initiatives in order to control the population. They wanted to have dependent labor and, at the same time, avoid paying taxes that would have been necessary to finance free education. Now then, how did this all translate to the economy as a whole? Well, pay attention because you are going to flip out. <laughs> As you can see, until 1860, Andalusia was actually the second richest region in Spain, second only to Madrid. It was not until the arrival of the 20th century that it really started slipping to become one of the poorest. Of course, not all of southern Spain is Andalusia, but even so, the data is surprising. If we have said that the cause of the poverty of southern Spain lay in the problems of land distribution, the powerful elites, and the rapid conquest, then how is it possible that Andalusia was so rich until 1860. Well, the key here is that the lack of education and land distribution did not really become a problem until the end of the 19th century. Up until that time, practically the entire Spanish economy was based on agriculture. There was no need for educated engineers or entrepreneurs with savings to create wealth, nor were there large commercial networks between different territories that would allow the development of a powerful industry. Proof of this is that there were hardly any roads or railroad lines. Trade was curtailed by expensive customs. And in fact, until 1868, Spain did not even have a single currency. So what does all this mean? Well, the Spanish provinces were economically isolated. The people lived off their crops and little else. In order for a region to be rich, all it needed was a lot of fertile land and enough people to cultivate it. And it turns out, southern Spain had both qualities. So it's no wonder Andalusia was so rich. However, the real problem came with the Industrial Revolution. 
In the second half of the 19th century, the Industrial Revolution began to take hold in Spain. With it, barriers to trade disappeared. In just 40 years, the mileage of railways increased fivefold, the amount of goods transported increased tenfold, and the financial system was unified. In 1868, the Bank of Spain issued the Peseta for the first time, a banknote that served to unify the payment systems of all the regions, and which allowed the promotion of trade and investment throughout the country. Almost overnight, Spain went from being a country with isolated regions to having an integrated economy and society, and that had consequences. From then on, wealth began to concentrate in a few northern provinces, specifically places like Catalonia and the Basque country began to grow at the expense of draining the economic potential that had been spread throughout the territory. But what did the unification of the national economy have to do with the rise of northern Spain and the fall of the south? The answer lies in industry. If you notice, the poor regions of southern Spain had a lot of trouble developing a competitive industry. However, northern regions, such as those mentioned, quickly achieved a large and competitive industry. Of course, industry was very profitable for the northern economies, much more so than agriculture, and this led them to build up a process of wealth creation that has lasted to this day. The question is, why did Spanish industry grow so much in the north, while in the south, it lagged so far behind? Well, visual economic viewers, here, the issue of education and the distribution of wealth were very important. You see, when it comes to setting up factories, you need people who are qualified, educated, who can read and write, understand machine manuals, and even have innovation skills. And as we have said, the level of education in southern Spain was considerably lower. But on top of a good education, in order to develop a powerful industry, entrepreneurs are needed. People with commercial skills and with some savings to start a business. And not surprisingly, in this respect, the North had another strong advantage. Northern citizens had more land than in the South, which was dominated by the elites. That is, many families were accustomed to business, to trade and innovation, and they also had assets with which they could save to start new businesses. Southern elites may not have had the incentive or knowledge to innovate in industry, and workers did not have the capital to do so on their own. But in the North, it was just the opposite. The economy, distributed in many hands, allowed the development of many industrial projects that eventually came to fruition. But even beyond this, there was one other reason that led to the success of Northern Spain, which was perhaps the most important of all. Here, we are talking about economies of scale. <laughs> You see, when the economic integration of Spain began, there was a huge process of concentration of the country's industry. That is, most of the factories were assembled and moved to the same places. That meant that, according to historians such as Sanchez Albornoz, Northern industrialization stole the industry that could have arisen in the south. But why did all the factories want to be in the same locations? Well, think about it. If you have a car factory, you will want to have a screw factory, a tire factory, and a sheet metal factory nearby. What's more, you will want to be in a place where many people live to serve as employees. You will want to have rail and road connections to transport goods, and you will want to be close to other entrepreneurs to learn from or partner with. But you will also want to be close to your customers in order to sell as much product as possible. Well, all these were conditions that the north of Spain fulfilled better than the south. Remember that the South had fewer cities and towns. That is to say, low density of employable population and potential buyers of products, few connections of highways, roads and railways, and in short, little capacity for business agglomeration. And if we add to that the lack of education and the problem of economic elites, the result is that Northern Spain became a more propitious place to start a new industry. Plainly and simply, over time, the factories were all clustered in the same place, all interested in being close to each other. In this way, the north of Spain specialized in industrial products, while the south of Spain specialized in agricultural products, which ultimately led to the difference in wealth that still exists today. Be that as it may, it should be noted that this is a much broader and more complex issue. There are more factors to take into account, such as the availability of natural resources, geography, or plain luck. But the theory that we have presented to you today comes out of very interesting recent academic reports that support these hypotheses very well, and which 
in case you are interested in getting to know them in depth. We'll leave you a link for them in the description. At this point, however, it is now your turn. What do you think was the factor that doomed the south of Spain? Do you think there is a solution? And what other reasons can you think of to explain this difference in wealth? You can leave me your answers in the comments. As always, don't forget that we release new videos every week, so subscribe to this channel and hit the little bell so you don't miss any of our updates. If you like this video, like it, and I'll see you in the next one. All the best, see you next time. Thank you.